Hello everybody, this is Luis Angel Carro Perez from Apisaco Tlaxcala and you're watching Teacher Learning Cast with Piri Herrera and Benjamin Stewart. Yeah! It's March 17th, 2018, and my name is Benjamin Stewart from beautiful Aguascalientes. Ben, good morning. This is Piri Herrera, also from Aguascalientes, Mexico, transmitting through different media here in the social networks and internet. I'm very glad to have episode five, Teacher Learning Cast. Yes, uh, today's topic, we're going to be talking about uh, the flipped classroom, and we have a very special guest today, Ken Bauer. Um, Ken has been uh, all over the internet. I've had the uh, other online space. He Today we want to really focus a lot on flipped learning. Uh, Ken is a full-time uh, professor at the computing science department at the, uh, the Tech de Monterrey in Guadalajara. And uh, he's been a member there since 1999. He's also the chair of the board learning network and he's been uh, he's held that position since 2016 so Ken thank you and welcome uh, thank you for joining us today in uh, teacher learning cast well thank you Benjamin thank you Piri um, I'm joining you from Zapopan here in the Guadalajara metro area originally from Victoria Canada and just a shout out to Saint happy St. Patrick's Day for all of all of the Irish or Irish lovers that like to celebrate this day I'm not Irish absolutely <laughs> yeah. Um, before we it's get into pleasure, pleasure. Sorry, sorry, it's a pleasure to meet you again. It's the first time I, I, I see him uh, and now through this new way of communicating and having these kind of talks. I'm really excited about the topic today and, and we're going to invite everybody to join us through the different media in the Facebook page for Teacher Learning Cast. You can look for it in that way. We have Benjamin Stewart uh, website, which is benjaminlstewart.wordpress.com. And you can get there with all the previous shows and what's going to happen today later on. And my own website at homers2000.weeksite.com slash pity with Y, the second one, H-A. And uh, there's uh, different media for communications. You can join us through Facebook and make comments. You can make comments in YouTube, in the YouTube transmission. And for the people that is watching the live in Facebook, click above and get, get to a better view and better sound for the transmission. For those of you who are joining us in Facebook, I posted a couple of questions asking uh, those of you uh, if you are currently flipping your classroom uh, to share your experiences, to let us know. There's a poll as well. So we encourage you, uh, if you're visiting now, to uh, let us know. Uh, we really value your input and want you to be as uh, much a part of the conversation as possible. So feel free to check the Facebook page and uh, let us know uh, your experiences with flipped learning, uh, whether you're watching this video, uh, uh, the recorded video, or if you're watching us live. So to get started here, uh, Ken, uh, before we start diving into the flipped classroom, could you provide a little bit of context to maybe describe uh, the types of classes uh, that you teach, that you're currently teaching this semester, and uh, the types of students that you uh, are working with. Right. So um, I'll, I'll give contacts outside of Mexico as well. So the Tecnológico de Monterrey is a, probably, I guess, the largest private institution university in all of Latin America, if I remember correctly. About 100,000 students across 30 campuses. Um, I believe that number includes undergraduate, graduate as, and I'm not sure if it includes our prep or high school grade 10, 11, 12 students. About 10,000 faculty. Guadalajara is the second largest campus in terms of undergraduate population. I teach computing science, um, mostly uh, the software engineering area, although I also teach computer information security. And I really like to focus on what's termed in our area CS1, the Computer Science 1 curriculum. So introductory programming for first year students is where most of my focus of teaching is. Okay. Are you teaching in uh, English or Spanish? 
Uh, yes, um, <laughs> mostly English. And one of the things is we tend to want to hire um, foreigners to speak English and, and help the students get more English in their classroom. Um, but I tend to get um, students, especially in those first year classes, where engineering tends to have the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum of students coming in, which means they tend to not have as great English before they show up. So um, I, I do have to dip into the Spanish quite a bit for those, those some of those students, ostensibly in English, though. OK, and is it uh, just curious, um, do you is it uh, in the syllabus? Is it stipulated one language over the other? Is there any type of policy or is it just kind of um, you work you work the languages as you need to or? There's a policy at the Tech de Monterrey. Actually, we make a big push to send Mexicans as well abroad. Um, there's, there's just an advertisement to send people to San Diego for an intensive month of English language training um, so that they can improve their English to give classes in English as Mexican teachers. Um, so it's in the policy. Um, I think all of my classes actually have a little flag on them in the banner system to say it's in English. Um, so it is policy. I actually get a little bit of money extra for teaching in English, which seems unfair since it's my native language, but I'll accept the cash. Um, right a little bit of Starbucks money. And, uh, but I, I, as always, I break the rules on everything. And I do speak in Spanish when it's needed for some of my students. Great, all right, so I'm getting into now flipped learning. Um, how would you go about explaining uh, what flipped is, what the flipped classroom is, or the approach is to someone who maybe is not familiar with the term that really is looking uh, is hearing this term for the first time. How would you go about to articulate what that means in the day-to-day -day grind of uh, teaching? It's it's always a, an interesting thing to try to explain, and, and I try to explain it by not saying what it isn't, because not taking that negative tact. And so what flip learning is, is we want to make the best use of our in-class time, assuming that we have in-class time, or at least in our best use of our one-to-one -one, um, synchronous time, especially if we're doing online learning. We have moments of synchronous connectivity like we do now between us. And so we want to make the best use of that time. And we deeply believe that the best use of that time is not just giving a lecture and not just feeding content to our students. So that's really the core of it. Um, flip around what traditionally is best um, best use of time is is actually sitting down and working with the students actively on activities inside the classroom. In my case, I teach computer science and programming. I want my kids with their laptops open or in front of the computers we use and actually actively programming during that class time where I'm there, I can help them. Their colleagues can help them in the classroom because I'm not there in their house, right? It would be very weird and very strange that I could be there in their house to help them while they're programming or in the in the cafeteria or in the, in the library wherever they were doing any homework i want that inside my classroom so that i can actively help them on the stuff that's the hardest part um, so that's the main thing and then obviously if we remove the direct instruction from inside the classroom then we have to move that somewhere and that's usually going to be outside of the classroom and that's kind of the classic view of flip we flip where we do the direct instruction and where we do the actively hand-on active learning Great. Um, yeah, go ahead, Petey. Uh, sorry, the thing is that I have my mic mute. Uh, last week, Ken, indeed, we were talking about uh, making decisions about uh, timing in the classroom, making the in-progress decision about timing. And it looks like right. this topic is a great deal about it, right? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Because, I mean, that that's the basic view. And and if you ask me what I think the real heart of flip classroom is, it's not about flipping space and it's not about time. It's not about, it's not about videos for sure. A lot of people hear flip classroom and they're thinking about the videos all the time. And it's definitely not that. I think the heart of flip learning is flipping the responsibility for learning, um, which means that I need to let go and of controlling of the pace of learning for my students and let go of where they're getting their information. But the students need to grab control and decide, well, I need to be able to learn to ask questions more and not be that silent one in the corner 
front of the classroom to be able to ask for help when I need it and specifically what I need. So time management be interesting because each different schedule and each student has a different pace in their learning. Um, and we can't just control. Um, of course, that becomes chaotic because as an as a educator, I need to know the pace of each one of those 20 or 30 or more students in my, each classroom and I'm running around like a maniac. It's 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 a little bit tiring. I'm a little bit um, exhausting running around my classroom and attending each one of those students. So it, it is a lot about time management for me. It's a lot about time management for my students. I know you guys were talking about being available um, outside of the classroom for your students. Um, right. I, I I forwarded through all four episodes. I haven't listened to all of them yet, but I was I was skipping through and I caught some pieces about that. Um, for me, it's really important what happens outside the classroom just as much about what happens in. Um, so my availability for my students um, is not 24 seven because I do sleep. Um, <laughs> and you gotta be careful that we don't overwork ourselves because I actually talk a lot about life balance with my students as well. But I think there's some key moments in time where we can be available and make a huge difference to our students when they're in their study time. So yeah, I, I love the conversation about time management and inside and outside the classroom. Yeah, you bring up something really interesting when you, uh, when you say flipping the responsibility. And I think that's, I can really relate to that. And I agree with you that uh, we really want our students to, to learn how to be more responsible for their own learning. Um, I myself sometimes find that to be a challenge, um, mm -hmm. thinking of it like almost as a cultural change to say, you know, some students are really used to having the teacher be more responsible for the, the quote unquote teaching and, and them being more of a passive uh, learner. I'm curious about with your experience, how have you dealt with this cultural shift, if indeed there has been a cultural shift, like how do you prepare students to the, of this idea of flipped learning? Uh, what's been your experience? So again, remember, um, there's a lot of context here, guys. Um, so I've been teaching here, actually 1999 is the date I was here as plant. I was, I've been here since 1995. Um, so I've got a lot of years teaching and also a lot of years teaching in the same institution. And we all know that our reputations precede us, right? So students know what they're getting into when they walk into a Ken Bauer classroom, right? Um, and also the other context is, is this is undergraduate. This is undergraduate within the Tecnologico de Monterrey. Every school has a different context. Um, so for me, and, and I'm, a, I'm a foreigner, right? And so I get away with a lot of stuff, and I always talk about this, that I can get away with weird things because I'm a foreigner and, and the Mexicans can't get away with the things I do. So that said, I walk into this situation with all my students just straight out and say, this is my pedagogy. This is how I approach teaching. This is how I approach learning. This is really important. I talk about the philosophy behind my pedagogy with my students. I lay it all out in front of them in the first week of class um, because I think my having a relationship with them that's transparent and honest is really, really important. That said, I've talked with a lot of people, in, including Dr. Julie Schell, um, who's one of the leaders in the community. And Julie says, no, 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 no. You don't, you don't even mention that word flip classroom because it brings a whole bunch of baggage with it. And then the students just, they might have heard about it, they might have seen it done poorly, and then they have an immediate negative reaction to it. And and actually lots of people in the education community, when you mention the word flip learning, they're ah, it's videos and blah, blah. And so there's a context you need to deal with within your situation of how you're going to approach going into flip learning. Uh, my style is definitely much more about transparency and Benjamin, you know that because I'm all about open education. And so that's just in my, in my blood and my philosophy of how I do everything. Um, so that's the way I, I approach it. And I like to uh, get feedback out of my students of how they're feeling with this approach. Well, transparency, it looks like uh, I got two guys of the same kind, right, Ben? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, 
And I think it's, uh, you mentioned two things. Well, there are many things that come to my mind and I'm just uh, making some notes to have a lot of questions, but uh, transparency, the last word you said in, com in combination with the reputation that precedes you, I think that's uh, really important because it comes to another word I have in here in my list, which is responsibility from the teacher. How, how big is the responsibility of, um, of really carrying out with this type of uh, flip classroom and the type of activities. Uh, I mean, two questions first, the responsibility itself mm -hmm. to not just ask students to do things for the sake of doing it and actually you knowing and being prepared for whatever comes, right? That's the first yep. thing. What, so, so what about that big responsibility? Oh, that's, that's huge, Piri. Um, So not just telling students what to do is 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 key there and that's actually uh let's see flip that would be the third pillar in the the four pillars of flipped learning where the first one's flexible environment the second one is learning culture the third one is intentional content um so that's the one we're going to talk about now and the fourth one's uh right. professional educator you can go look at that at fliplearning.org so intentional content's important um we want to make sure we're we're assigning work to our students to not just be busy work but to actually be with a purpose for the actual learning objective that we want to achieve at that point in time. Now, if we're doing flip learning at a much more deep level and not just a simple flip, um, more towards flip mastery and really putting the responsibility on the student, that means that I have a responsibility to let go control of the pacing. And so now that intentional content isn't for the group, it's for each individual learner. And that's really, really hard to do. Um, I'm not, I don't want to scare people off that this is Ken Bauer after probably five or six years of evolution. Um, well, 20 something years of evolution, but probably five or six years of um, actual focus on evolving my pedagogy. I've gotten to this point where I am now. Um, and I don't want people thinking, ah, I got to do this craziness right at the beginning. My first flip was I took all the homework I used to assign after class and we did it inside class. It was actually the same assignments. It was just, here we go. Here's your homework assignment. And I gave it to them at the beginning of class. And the intention was that they would finish at the end of the class. And the outside content was, please read the chapters from the book or whatever I thought was lined up. And it was definitely um, uh, aligned in terms of time and space for the students as a group. I didn't individualize as much at the beginning. I, I want to make that a little bit clear to not freak people out. What I do now is much, much more responsibility on me of knowing where each one of my students is. And that's really hard. It's, it's not easy. It's a big chunk of time. And how do you deal with this pacing, like uh, deadlines or syllabus or, or, or how, how do we move all this around? Maybe you mix the syllabus all around during the semester for each student or what happens? Then? Um, so the only way to learn time management is to uh, be responsible for your time management and usually fail at it. Um, and, and one of the activities I do with my students at the beginning of this, the week, I've got some videos there somewhere, is uh, a la Robin Williams and Dead Poet Society. I don't get them to stand on the desks because I get in trouble, although I'm, I'm not immune to getting in trouble. Um, I usually have them stand on chairs we have the rolling chairs now, so can't do that anymore. It's too dangerous. Um, but I get them to stand up and shout that it's okay to fail, right? And it's really important for my students to know that you don't have to get it right to start with. Um, and so that's part of a philosophy I had when I actually did grade things, because now I have an abolished grading system, which is a separate discussion, um, that the deadline is the end of the semester. Um, but... I want them and I recommend times for them to do each of the activities that they have lined up during the semester and they self pace themselves and the bonus to doing things early besides, you know, less stress in your life at the end of the semester is, Hey, if I do something early, I can get feedback from Ken and feedback from the other students. And if there is a point or grading system, I can do it again and get more points. And so putting more control into them in terms of managing their time and their assignments is, is key to my philosophy. And this isn't, this is going past flip learning probably too. It sounds great. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about many things in my mind. Sorry, Ben, because I'm going to fill of, up your brain today. Uh, period. You said, 
uh, they looking for the reward or the extra mm -hmm. bonus of having the feedback. That's great because sometimes they don't even uh, care about it. But but I mean, you're getting to that point where they actually are looking for it because they want the uh, feedback they, and not just the points. Right, exactly. I mean, and 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 then uh, the pointing and the um, and the scoring and the grade and everything. It it, it seems to me that it's uh, covertly getting to a second place, which is ideal, right? In in, in right. from my point of view. And we still need grades. I still have to submit them, right? Um, okay. Right now, my grading system is we sit down and have a conversation and we discuss what your grade is. Um, but in the past, there was as much more flexibility in terms of when they hand things in and they can they can improve their marks. And and not everyone gets a hundred or whatever your top scale is because some people just don't get around to it, or some people are satisfied with an eighty or an eighty-five or a seventy or or whatever it is. So. Um, in my experience with grading, I, I really should write this stuff up someday. Um, my grades haven't really changed over the last five, six years in terms of, of average. Um, the distribution tends to push up the lower grades because um, there's a lot more connecting with my students. Uh, the ones that are poor performing, and, and this is not because of ability, this is probably because of all sorts of other factors that are nothing to do with my classroom um, I think tend to improve because I'm connecting with my students and they trust me and they can come and talk to me about issues they're having in and outside of the classroom and, and I think um, flip learning a big big win is I know my students better I know them by name they've only taken one class with me and I see them three years later and I and I say hello to them by name in the, in the hallway they're like how do you know my name the teacher I've taken five classes with still doesn't know my name and so that's probably one of the biggest wins I have. Great. Um, I wanted to to back up a little bit, if we could. Mm -hmm. You mentioned intentional content, and this mm -hmm. is one of the four pillars that, for me, I find really interesting. And I wanted to get some of your viewpoints on on this particular uh, pillar. Um, when when I think of flipped learning, and you mentioned intentional content, I'm wondering how much of the content is receptive in the sense that they go out, seek the information, and it's more kind of instructional, uh, so, so to speak. How much of that content is are, is deliberate and prepackaged beforehand mm -hmm. from the teacher? How much of it comes incidentally? Uh, that is, the students just find and seek it on their own, thinking kind of in terms of inquiry-based uh, learning. Mm -hmm. And the second part of that is looking at content in general, it could be something, of course, that they seek themselves, but also they could produce uh, videos, audios, text. Mm -hmm. They could produce content that in and of itself turns into be part of, a part of the content for the particular class. So my, my question to you is how strict is this idea of intentional content uh, in terms of receptive and productive types of perspectives, and how much of it is uh, prepared or maybe could be produced by the students themselves. Right, so there's, how much am I directing the actual content choice um, as opposed to the other side of the pendulum letting the students find their own stuff, and then student-created content makers? Um, excellent question. So again, it was an evolution. Um, I started with much more of a decision of, okay, these are the topics of my course, and this is my choice of each one of the content for each one of these topics. And this is another big, huge bonus for using open educational resources, and especially when they're free, because you don't, you're not going to sign six textbooks that cost money to your students because they're going to freak out. Um, if they're free, then you can use as many as you want. It's not a big deal, although you have to deal with cognitive overload and the students dealing with, I have eight resources um so i started with much more kind of and and this is my um logical approach to things i would like each topic has three options and here's three references you could use to learn this topic and and that worked pretty well um but then my students kind of freaked out because they're not used to having choice and, the, and they were like overloaded and I, I god there's way too much to read ken you're giving us too much i'm like but you're allowed to choose one from each one of these categories 
and they, they totally were not used to this concept of choice. And that really occurred to me. And then I thought, well, maybe I just won't give you any choices and I'll just go spin the pendulum wholly the other way and not even say what Ken's recommendation is for each topic. You guys go out and find it. We'll share with each other in our Facebook group or whatever our communication mechanism is. And so you can share with each other what you think the best resource is for each thing. And then students started to freak out a little bit because they'd say, Ken, it took me an hour to find the right resource and only about you know 20 minutes to learn about the, the topic that I was looking for to learn about. And I said, well, good. I mean, you got better at looking for stuff. So that's actually a, a meta, meta skill that I think is really important in, in your development as a, as a learner. But it still upset them a lot because they wasted a lot of time and they could have been playing League of Legends instead. Um, so I, I think there's a, there's a balance in between that. Um, and the wonderful thing is when the students went out and found resources, they found stuff that we're not going to find, right? That, I mean, we've got our our view of the internet or view of the world and where we find our resources. And my students found awesome resources that I didn't know about. So that was the wonderful part. And and then my pendulum came around a little bit and I thought, well, some, some of my students, and this was based on teaching evaluations, and the majority of my students love this style. And there's this small population that just killed me on my teaching evaluations. There's a post on my blog about that. Um, and then I decided some students need rails. They need a scaffolding setup of what to do. They really, really need that. And other ones are like super mega happy about all this freedom. And, and so I need to be even more flexible that I can be flexible for the ones that need more flexibility, but I can be more rigid with the ones that need more rigidity. And, and so that's where I kind of went to a different level of how am I going to find this stuff? Um, way to um, give the right content intentionally for each student that needs it. Now for student generated content, this is a wonderful question. Um, when I first did my first version of mastery, what I did was a real simple grading system and I had lots of micro assignments and the students had to master each topic and they could get zero, one or two points on the OSU outstanding satisfactory unsatisfactory scale um, where unsatisfactory is, well, you're not showing me anything, so you got to do it again. Um, and satisfactory is you showed me that you understand the concept. They could tell it to me. They could show it to me with code or whatever. To get an outstanding level, they had to be able to teach something to someone. And, and what a lot of my students jumped onto was creating YouTube videos. They just loved it. And so they were creating a lot of content of how to teach, um, how to do a for loop in Python or whatever we were working on. Um, and that was a lot of fun. And the students really loved it. Um, actually, I was just on a podcast last week. It's like podcasting week for me. Um, Stories and Edu podcast. And and I told this story right at the end because we have to tell a story about student making videos. Uh, there was this girl from Sweden and, and her videos were a blast uh, because they were always upside down because she couldn't figure out how to change that in her camera settings. And so it was, it was, it was something original and fun. But what she told me was in order to understand, in order to explain this content, I have to really, really understand it. And I was like, bingo, this is exactly what I want. This is wonderful. And I'm glad this came out of you. Um, and then to take a little further, a lot of the students were learning the content in next semesters. And this has to do with open content that my students are sharing in the open. They were learning about the topics in my class from students who had presented either in video format or blog format and written about the topics. So the students making this content actually provided content for the next semesters down the line and probably people on the rest of the internet. So um, the making content I thought was a wonderful progress um, and it's still key in, in my kind of connectivism theory of my pedagogy. Right, so you still you see a, a a lot of flexibility then maybe in that term intentional content being uh, accepting some content that could be maybe incidental and mm -hmm. it could also be generated from the student. So I think that's really something because I your your uh, your experiences are very similar to mine and and I think that's if anyone is thinking about implementing flipped classroom, I think that's important. This idea of intentional content really being uh, looked at from different perspectives, the, the mm -hmm. perspectives being incidental versus intentional, also 
uh, receptive type of or productive types of perspectives when you're looking at students, where are they producing mm -hmm. uh, content or just using or consuming content uh, for a particular purpose or to solve or a problem? Dial it back. Just to be more simple, don't assign every odd question at the back of each chapter just because we that's what we always do, right? Because it maybe it's too much. Yeah, and then this paradox of choice, I think, really rings true. I mean, uh, we, some students really thrive on making choices, and others just say, tell me what to do. I've had mm -hmm. that. I have some students who just mm -hmm. flat out tell me, tell we, me we all what this I week. need to do, and that's what I do. If they ask me, if they, if they is this what you want? How many words is it? Yeah, so I think a level of flexibility certainly is, uh, is important. Pity? Yes, I'm. I'm listening to to all that you're saying, and it uh, and it's kind of similar of, of uh, what is happening with my students in in teaching practicum. Uh, the, the the kind of a difference is that they are more in the field doing the mm -hmm. things, uh, but during the lesson planning and the preparation, that's what they go through to the sources and the books. I'd like to make a brief pause, uh, but before. <laughs> just to invite our, our, our people to join the social networks in which we are. But before, I, I'm going to ask you, Ken, about, um, I know it's unfair and, and, and to, to shrink uh, flipped classroom or ideas like this to an example, to a single example, which is kind of difficult. And, and I want to make this clear for the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not talking about one thing or one task or one specific aspect to do. But I don't know if you, in the meantime, can can think a bit of, of something that that you uh, uh, that one of the assignments or tasks or things you deal with from for the outside, and then what actually happens as an example in the in the classroom itself. Uh, right, right. But but I I know it's uh it, it's kind of difficult to put it that way. But but uh, I don't know if you go through the previous shows. You know I'm all about the specific mm -hmm. sometimes. So in the meantime, while, while you think about it, uh, I, I want to invite everybody to join us to all the different social media. We have uh, different ways for contact. You can send us your comments, your questions, whatever you want to share with us. You can come to the show if you want to. Just let us know and, and we arrange something. You can do it online as Ken is doing today. Our first guest for Teacher Learning Cast in episode five. Uh, or you can come live to uh, one of the places in which you can be here with me or with Ben and, and have this transmission. You can look for us in Facebook as Teacher Learning Cast, and you can follow us and see all the previous shows there and questions and whatever we are uploading. And there's Benjamin Stewart website. Benjamin Stewart's website is benjaminlstewart.wordpress.com. My personal website, homers2000.weeksite.com slash pd. Y in the second I, it's not I, it's P-I-R-Y-H-A, P-D. Uh, and, um, and you can leave comments, questions, suggestions, tell us what you want us to talk about, who you want us to invite, and uh, tell us if you disagree on what we are saying, because sometimes uh, we disagree ourselves, and after the show, Ben and I get into real fights, but then we uh, make friends again, and we are all happy to be here with you and broadcast again. So today we are having our first guest in the show, episode five, Teacher Learning Cast with Ken Bauer from Tech de Monterrey in Guadalajara. And he's talking about something really interesting and, and exciting, which is Flip Classroom, which I come to understand it's a brand new in bold topic as that name, but it has a lot of features from different kind of uh, approaches and things for learning and teaching. And, and Ken has been talking about really interesting things like responsibility, like um, like the type of uh, situations with the timing, like the situations with the scoring, so you can go back later on and watch about it. And right now, I, I just wanted to ask Ken about something uh, that he can tell us as an example of what goes on outside the classroom, knowing that what really goes outside is the student's deal. And then they are actually the ones that know what really happens. But Ben has an uh, Ken, sorry, has an idea about about what he is asking or or how he asks for things that that may occur outside the classroom and things that specifically happen inside the classroom. So Ken, 
unmute my microphone. Excellent. I just put a link. There's an excellent link of um, what flipped learning actually, your definition of flipped learning from Dr. Robert Talbert. I just shared it in the Facebook group there for teaching uh, teacher learning. So something more specific about actually what happens in my classroom. So the the base first kind of stab at flip learning for a lot of teachers will be, okay, I, I want to put active hands-on work in my classroom. I've got an assignment planned. I've got all my lesson plans set up. So how is this going to work? And um, and this is actually when we do the, uh, the uh, flip learning seminars, which I think it's been a couple of years. We better spin another one up. Um, I always ask teachers to kind of plan their flip lesson. And so what you probably want to plan is, all right, so they're going to see some content before they come to the class, and maybe it's just going to be reading. It depends on your time, your setup, your your comfort level. I highly recommend doing videos, and, and this really depends on your setting and your class um, and, and the culture. Um, but the students really like the videos because they're watching their teacher talk to them. Um, not with them, but to them. And so videos are great, and that's why you also want kind of your head in the bottom corner of the video as well, because they do identify with you and they like to see their teacher, because um, they like you, and that's a good thing. So I, I tend to, what I would do, and I, I don't do a lot of videos, but I, I for some of my classes, I would make a video say about, how, we're gonna talk about for loops and how for loops work in Python, and for loops are different, and while loops, and, and what I would do is I would use a screencasting software like Screencast-O-Matic, or, or one of these free versions, there's something called Screencastify, which is a plugin for Chrome. I personally use Camtasia from TechSmith. It's a commercial software. There's an educational pricing you can get. Um, I like it because it's easy to use and it, it gives a lot of extra features that I could use if I want to do professional videos. Um, so I, I fire up screen or, or Camtasia. I'm recording what's on my laptop screen and I'm recording my video, I'm recording my audio of me speaking to the students, and I'm also, if I want to, I can record the sounds from my computer. Not so important for me, but maybe a history teacher's watching a video of something while they're discussing on top of it. So that's called screencasting. And what I'll do is I'll bring up my text editor on my programming environment, and I actually go through an example from zero to done of me doing some kind of programming task really important that I start with a blank piece of paper because that's what students start with and we want to kind of show them how do I get from zero to finished and it's not a direct line it's I'm writing stuff um, I gonna check that it's working oh I made a mistake I need to fix this I need to move this around and they don't see it as being a linear line from start to finish and I think that's really important they see me working on it it's also really important that I actually do make mistakes. It's actually really important that I say, huh, I forget how you do this. Let me go over to Google over here and I'm going to look for it because that's what they're going to do and that's what we do in software engineering. So I show them an actual practice of me doing something. Um, and then I fire that up. I try to keep it short. The kind of rule of thumb is one and a half minutes per grade level. Um, but honest, university students don't want to watch a video more than 10 minutes long either. Um, so I try to keep them five, six, seven minutes. Better to have a bunch of short videos than long ones. And so I, I release that. And, and I release it ahead of time. Usually the students will watch it. Some of them won't. Some of them will see the beginning and they go, "Ah, I already know how to do this. I don't need to watch Ken tell me how to do it. Um, and then they come to class and they work on the assignment that we have that's related to that video. Um, in your first lesson plan for doing something like this, you might want to assign the videos and, and it'll start that the students don't watch a video because they know that they're used to sitting in your classroom and just listening to you tell them the content. So they might not have watched the video. They might not have read the book. So might you want, might want to put a quiz at the beginning of class and, and check that they actually did watch the video and got the content out of it. So that's probably a good first approach is put some kind of... Um, some kind of formative quiz at the beginning of class, use Kahoot, use Socrative, or use whatever tools you want to use, or just paper and pen, or ABC is the answer, and hey, just raise a piece of paper to see what, what your answer is. Um, so you might want to start with that, and then let's get hands-on. They'll be working on the assignment. 
um, you're walking around the class seeing what they're doing you might notice that there's this key thing that a lot of people are having problem with and I'm okay I want to stop the class let's stop everyone let's pay attention to me because it's the teacher talking which you try not to do um, this is a common thing that's happening let me explain this maybe I'll go over it on the board or something and then let's get back to hands-on activity and maybe at the end you also want to have kind of an exit survey uh, quiz to see how people are doing either a formative quiz or maybe you want to do a summative assessment at the, at the end of your class there's an excellent video by um, John flipping physics he has a very good set of videos explaining flipped learning and he has this good video that explains the difference between a traditional classroom and a flipped classroom and he shows the key differences in his class um, it's high school physics um, same class about a year apart and he shows the different style of doing it in a traditional mode and a flipped mode. So I'd recommend checking out that video. I'll pass you guys the links later. There's a chat there somewhere. It's right, our back, really, it's our back channel. Yeah. Okay. Really, really. Uh, I mean, things and things come uh, come and go, and we can keep on talking and talking. Ben. Yep. Yeah. Um, so Ken, I wanted to ask you about this notion of, of homework and the flipped learning classroom. Now, what I, you know, a lot of us have this idea of homework and we think about work done outside of, uh, of the class. What's your interpretation? How do you view homework? Do you make a distinction between what that means in terms of flipped learning or is simply what they do or need to do in a flipped learning environment? Is that considered homework? If, because a lot of times we were in our planning, we think, okay, we're going to be doing this in class, and then they need to spend X amount of time outside of class to to also achieve the course objective. So I'm mm -hmm. curious about what your take is on uh, on the notion of, of homework within a flipped learning uh, context. Right, and so the link I just sent in the Facebook group is is John's. Uh resources for flipped learning. And John actually talks about this in the video where he mentions the word homework and then he goes, oh wait, we don't call it homework anymore because we call it book work, right? There's there's the direct instruction and there's the hands-on work and those are different. So now we're not sending the kids home to do work in terms of like the activities and the exercises and the essays or whatever they're working on because they're not doing that at home anymore. What they're doing at home is maybe watching videos or doing some reading or actually receiving the content of direct instruction in some format where they're going to apply it inside the classroom. So we call it, we don't call it homework so much, although it's homework because they're doing it home. But um, I, I think that the key here, Benjamin, is, um, and this is one of the keys to flip learning is, and, and we explain to people is, if I'm giving you a lecture in class, right, there's half the students, well, not half, a, a bunch of students I've lost in the first five minutes because boom I just went over their head they're totally lost screw it I'm lost I'm not paying attention anymore and they disconnect there's this other group at the front or the side I don't know and they're like god this is boring I already know this stuff maybe they failed the semester before and they're repeating it maybe they already learned this in high school and they're just dropping out disconnecting because I'm going way too slow for them and then there's that magical student right right in the middle of the classroom where everything's paced perfect for her. And she just loves this. I'm just doing everything at the exact pace that she needs, which she's fictional. She doesn't exist, right? And so this direct instruction of me controlling the pace inside the classroom just doesn't work. And, and we can't make that work outside the classroom either. Or maybe some student, if I'm making videos, needs to watch my video five times. Maybe she needs to go to that cool setting in YouTube and slow this crazy Canadian down to 0.75 speed because I speak too fast, right? Because um, we get that reputation, especially Americans. Um, or I'm I'm talking way too slow and they want to go 1.5 times speed because then they understand it better and they get it done faster and they can go play League of, League of Legends, right? Or they tell me, Ken, I don't, I don't understand the way you're explaining this. Can you point me to a different resource? So different students have a different way that they need to learn that content outside of the classroom and we got to give them more flexibility of how to do it they're not all going to spend 25 minutes doing this activity and then 15 minutes doing that activity we can't rigidly control that time um, we just got to be careful that they're actually doing it um, because if they didn't watch the video 
you got to ask them, why didn't they watch the video? Is it because they already know it and they don't need to? That's fine with me. Some people freak out and they want everyone to watch their video. Um, but maybe it's because they just didn't get around to it and they expect to come to class and the teacher's going to go, oh, let's check who watched the video. And nobody watched the video. And you go, hmm, oh, well, I guess I'll just teach this like the way I used to. And then that creates positive reinforcement. And the students go, ah, don't have to watch the video because if we all don't watch the video, we'll come to class and he'll just give us a lecture again. Yeah, that, that's that's a good point. I wanted to share my screen really quickly here. We've been talking about um, flipped learning and I know you're part of the uh, flipped learning network and you mentioned the four pillars. So I, right. I would encourage everyone to visit uh, this the website flippedlearning.org where you can find in more detail information about the four pillars. It's up there um, in the menu of about at the top for people right, who go there at the top and definition about and a definition. definition. Right. Mm -hmm. Also, I'd recommend uh, checking out Flipped Learning Today. I'm curious if all of these websites, I, I pulled up uh, your website there that um, that you're part of, this, this particular one, Flipped Learning Today. There's also a Facebook page, I believe. I don't know. I yeah, if you go to bit dot if you go to bit.ly slash flip Mexico, it will redirect redirect to our Facebook group of Flip Learning Latin America. And that's the Facebook page for Flip Learning Network as well. These are all okay. resources. Yep. Great. And we'll uh, we'll try to include that uh, all these links uh, in the description. And those four pillars are also translated to Spanish as well on that page for those that want the Spanish version. Oh great. And these are all released under a Creative Commons open license, so you can you can use them as long as you're not using them for commercial purposes. And I believe it's under a share alike. Okay. So a, a non-commercial share alike license. I was, I was actually looking for I that. Believe uh, so. I, I could it's at the bottom of the document. If you go right into the PDF, it okay. has the license at the bottom. Is the entire website under that same creative commons license, the flip to learning network? All of our stuff is, except the website. The cool thing about this website, and I'll invite teachers, is um, if you have something to share, what we do is we do a system of syndication where we can syndicate where you're publishing on your blog, and I believe Benjamin has shared stuff here. Um, so that means you can mark stuff on your own blog to get sucked into ours and re-syndicated and give you some more audience. Um, that, there's a manual process there, and, and Kelly makes sure that we're accepting stuff that works. Um, but I obviously am not forcing our Creative Commons license on your content that you're syndicating to us. So the stuff created by us is under that license. The stuff from contributors is under their own license. Great. <clears throat> Excellent. All right. uh, Ken, just um, wrapping up everything we, we have heard today, um, I'm uh, kind of getting ideas, and, and, and I'd like, uh, I like to rephrase many things in, in, into mm -hmm. A short kind of idea I'm getting right now. So in a traditional classroom, we have pretty much the resources outside and then the teacher working with the resources and, and, and bringing to the classroom in, in, in a format of task and activities, something to, for students to carry out and then to have the assessment pretty much. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm understanding that this idea and all this flipped classroom it's the other way around. We have a task to achieve, a real task to achieve an assignment. And then uh, we have a lot of resources there. And mm -hmm. then we have the tutor, the teacher, and the student. And is I'll meet you at the task or I'll meet you at the resources somehow. Because then I work with the resources to, uh, to achieve the assignment and at least to, sh to show or to support a little bit of student in one path to get to it. But in, in truth, what I'm just doing is just uh, meeting the student at the, at the task because then the student himself is gonna achieve the task in any way they, mm -hmm. they consider proper for themselves. Right? Am I right at mm -hmm. that or am I getting it wrong? That, that, that sounds excellent. The, the, again, the yeah. best use of our face-to-face -face time. When we're there with our students, we want to help them actually do the activity, which is the, the kind of product of the learning that we want to achieve. The receiving information, the direct instruction in terms of whether it's reading or watching videos or looking at someone's PowerPoint or whatever the content is, they do that themselves 
um, and then come to the classroom with us, assuming we're in a physical classroom, and actually do the activities we want to do. And they could be math exercises. They could be acting out something in drama class. It depends on your on your domain, obviously. And and we're there to help. And not just us, the teacher. Their colleagues are there to help as well, right? They've got a big study group of the entire classroom at the same time, which is which is an extra bonus that we're all there working on these things together. Yep. Yeah, and I don't know if you would agree with this, Kim, but it seems, you know, my takeaway uh, of all of this is how can we create, and, and again, I think most of us are, are speaking in terms of that we have a, some, you know, some level of face-to-face -face class, right? And then how do we incorporate outside work and outside experiences into that face-to-face -face course? How do we create the best face-to-face -face learning experience where we ask students to do certain things outside the classroom and they see the relationship and motivation of doing that so right. that they can better participate in that face-to-face -face life experience. I mean, would you agree with that? Uh, you know, that yes, there? because in, in the traditional thing, right, the outside work is homework or, or, or doing assignments or quizzes or essays or whatever. You can farm that out. You can get your mom or dad or cousin or sister or some website that does it for you. But you can't farm out them reading the stuff for you so that you can come to class prepared to actually do the activities. You can't fake that. There's just no way for them to fake that. And that's that's one beauty is, and students aren't used to this, right? Um, students are good at playing school. A lot of us, we were. And, and so we were become very efficient, but giving them this control means they need to see the benefit of, okay, the benefit of me doing the reading or watching the video or preparing for stuff is when I come to class, it's going to be fast, right? Or, or it's going to be efficient or it's going to be fun or whatever they want when they get into the classroom and then get their stuff done quickly and maybe move on to something else in their classroom. That's a different issue of how you want to handle your classroom management but they see the actual benefit of doing that work before they come to class, as opposed to the benefit of doing the stuff after class, which is usually some homework assignment that's gonna get graded. And the best way to do that is probably get someone else to do it. So you get your hundred, right? I mean, if you're talking coldly about it. Yeah, I mean, it's really- So we eliminate about, it. Yeah, I think it's about how we add value. Do we add value to our classroom experience? <clears throat> And what can we do to add that value? If they can do it on their own, why do it with us? You know, I mean, if they can do it yeah. in from a video. Um, but I'm really, I think this is really interesting, especially from PD's perspective, too, as being uh, really heavily involved in the teaching practicum strand of our BA. How do right. we train teachers? We almost, you know, it's, how do you train them to adapt and be part of this flipped learning experience? It almost, in some cases, becomes counterintuitive when you're thinking you're you're training teachers to to teach and 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 use use of board and you know voice projection and and giving examples and everything. It seems to me a challenge uh, to to be in a teacher training program really to adapt these uh, the flipped learning experience. I don't know, Petey, what you what you think. Okay, it might be that. beautiful that you're doing teacher training because. If you give them more opportunity to teach each other inside the classroom, then they're actually applying what they're supposed to be learning, right? Yeah, that's. I, I find it fascinating to talk to people that teach teachers. When I get the podcast with Carolina Buitrago from Colombia, who's an English language teacher, um, teaching English as a second language, I, I was asking her, "This is cool. You're like teaching teachers. How, how, how is the results on this about teaching teachers? Because I don't, I don't have that." Oh, we are actually doing kind of the flip classroom in total. And, uh, and, and, and that's what I, I, what I said at the beginning, like they actually go and do the, the field task and uh, they are supposed to be prepared uh, before with the previous classes and the classes that go along with uh, theoretical aspect methodology and all these things. And then they come to us, the tutors from, from, uh, from the practicum strand and they actually go and do it. And we, we just go along like helping them uh, week by week, just uh, revising what whatever they have been achieving and what they are facing. And uh, if, if if you go back to the previous shows, we have discussed things like 
uh, the transformation in my case that I've suffered from the beginning, being the a teacher, most, more, more than a tutor, telling the students things uh, and, and trying to make them remember or tell them e exactly aspects that they are supposed to know from theory. And, and little by little making that transformation towards the person that is asking and, uh, and, and asking them how they're doing, what they need, uh, how they think they could do it. And, and what I found to, to um, right now, and, and, and that's the core of, this, of the actual situation with most of my students, is that uh, sometimes they are not prepared to independently look for the resources not for the language teaching itself, not for the language itself. They know all about that and they know books and they go to grammar books and whatever, but methodological aspects, that's where they have, uh, they, they have some struggle. They go back to notes. And if it is something that was not, not stressed by the previous teachers, they limit themselves to that. So uh, what I'm tending to do, and that's recent, is that I'm, I'm, I'm uh, having together, and that was uh, part of the experience of the week I, I wanted to talk about, but maybe we can discuss it uh, in a further show. Uh, having a students have more information, more uh, different, different uh, parts of the theory from articles, from authors, from videos, from other uh, type of resources, and make it available for them with the intention that from one thing they skip to another. So for example, one specific thing I do, I ask them in the reflection, in the written reflections, after they finish with their reflection, I ask them to include at least one theoretical aspect, whether Googled or from books or from whatever they can uh, get a source that relates to any of the aspects they are talking and discussing about in their reflection. But one of the emphasis I made there is that if along that search of theory for one specific thing, they come across something else that matches whatever happened during the week, add it to the reflection. And somehow uh, the main struggle is that, that they are not used to doing this kind of activities, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah. Go, go ahead, ahead Benjamin. No, you oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Okay. So, well, I would, I would just add, uh, I, uh, and from another perspective, too, thinking in terms of our BA degree in English language teaching, that all of us, too, that, that aren't necessarily a part of the practicum strand, they, the, the, all the students look at our own practice. They look at their own, our classes that we teach. And those of us who are using uh, flipped learning in different degrees, they're learning uh, indirectly what to do and what not to do. They're learning what works, what isn't working. And the hope here is that they can transfer some of that knowledge to their own teaching, if, even if it's a, perhaps a different type of English course, if it's a general English course or an academic course or English for specific purposes. But I think that we all have a responsibility, all the teachers uh, who are training teachers to take it upon ourselves to really look and reflect on our own teaching and trying to make our own teaching transparent by sharing and, and sharing our successes and our challenges to see what's working, but realize that we are making uh, an impression on, on our students in terms of, you know, again, what's, what happens to be working and what, what doesn't. Yeah, I was just going to mention a lot of what Piri is saying here and what I saw in the, in the topics for the previous episodes of the podcast is, because you're you're teaching teachers or you're dealing with teachers and this is this is cool to me because I don't deal with this but this is a professional educator this is pillar four right and, and getting to that point of we're here on a Saturday morning talking about education right and my my kids are making noise outside and and some people are like what this is your day off right and 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 I said the the term twenty four seven teacher before. Um, and it's kind of true. There's not Ken on Facebook, Ken, and then Ken the teacher, Ken on Facebook, which a lot of us do. I don't because I can't separate me, the teacher, from me, the dad, from me, the uh, I like to watch hockey and whatever else. I'm just one person. Of course, we need to be really careful and not overwork ourselves and, and, and abandon other parts of our lives. But this is part of being a professional educator. They're, they're always reflecting on our practice, as you said, Bren, and thinking how can we approve, how can we apply what we saw 
or what we heard on this podcast that's in our ears as we're driving down the road to work. Um, how can we apply this to our practice and apply it to our students? And for you, how could you transmit this to these other teachers, which is it's just beautiful as well, because you're having a larger impact by teaching these teachers. Ken, I'm, 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 I'm awfully glad uh, we have you with us today. Uh, we're coming, I guess, to towards the end. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but um, many things come to my mind, and, and I got a lot of ideas today to, to start uh, cutting edges and shaping better things that are happening, that are actually happen in, in my personal daily teaching practice with my students, with my teachers' information. And, and, and definitely, I'm going to take a lot of things that, that today, I'm going to watch the video right away. <laughs> Before it gets, it gets on, on demand, I'm going to watch it again. And I'm going to take some of, of the things, because um, uh, I have tons of notes of things that you were saying, one after the other, that immediately picture things that happens in professional practicum here in, in our BA. And, and, and things, it's like things that... Uh, uh, yeah. that are really shaping uh, better and polishing aspects that already happened. Uh, I'm really glad you were with us today. Ben, anything else we, we need to not forget? And if we need to take more time, just uh, fire away. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, Ken. You really pro provided a lot of insight, a lot of things to think about uh, for those who are thinking about flipping the classroom as well as those who are currently doing so. Uh, we really encourage everyone to participate and let us know. We're curious how you're flipping the classroom, challenges that you're facing, successes that you've had. Feel free to share in Facebook. We have a Facebook page, Teacher Learning Cast. It's a public page. We appreciate all the likes and those who have commented thus far. And uh, we frequent those pages and try to get information and feedback. Let us know what you like about the uh, show, things that, uh, things, the areas that we can improve upon. Uh, we're, it's all good. So feel free to give us some uh, feedback as to uh, what we're doing here with the show. And um, I think we'll go ahead and conclude there again. Uh, Ken, uh, thanks a lot for your participation. We really do appreciate it. And I, I uh, are there any uh, websites where they can follow you or contact you if uh, they want to get in touch with you to, to learn more about the flipped classroom? Yeah, thank you so much. I'll always repeat that when we're when we're actually having these conversations or we're giving conferences or something i learn so much more than just people learning from me i mean that's why i love doing this so they can find me on twitter ken underscore bauer don't go to the one without the underscore because that's another ken bauer who actually now says he's the other ken bauer um or my website is kenbauer.me kenbauer.me you can find my links to all other social medias there um Definitely reach out and talk to me. Go to flippedlearning.org to find out more information about uh, the Flip Learning Network and Flip Classroom. And it's been a pleasure. And thank you for uh, letting me join. It's an honor to be the first guest. Oh, Ken, any place you are presenting something soon? I, I presented recently in Aguas Calientes for, for a private school. I um, Am I presenting anything soon? Not publicly. I've, I've really kept back my, my travel. I'm going to be giving something for the University of Guadalajara soon. There's the uh, Flip Tech East Coast event, which is happening in July. Aaron Sams will be the keynote as well as Kelly Walsh. You can check out fliplearning.org on the sidebar. Um, this is a conference which is in the East Coast of the U.S., somewhere in the New York area, I believe. Um, if you're interested in people coming from around the world, we hope to offer more events like that through the Flip Learning Network. Join our Slack. We have a Slack for conversation for people interested in flip learning. All of that uh, links are there on the flippedlearning.org website. Great. Well, uh, from, from my end, uh, I want to thank you a lot again. And uh, well, after noon today, or maybe today at late night, you're going to have the on demand video. So you can watch again all of this stuff and listen to all these interesting ideas and topics for this uh, flip learning. Ben. Okay, thanks a lot everybody for watching. We get together every Saturday morning at 8.15 Central Standard Time. So if you ever wanna be a part of the live broadcast, reach out to us, let us know. We're always looking for people to participate. And uh, again, thanks everyone for watching and we'll see everyone in the next video. Cheers for everyone, keep on learning. Thank you very much.